Hello, everybody, um, and welcome to this episode of CFO 4.0. So it's a really interesting one this week um, because we are actually doing this live from the Gen CFO Academy. So with me today, <laughs> Chris is celebrating. So we are on day two of the Academy. So this is a great opportunity for us to interrogate Chris on all the fab things he's learned and for, for you guys listening to get a sneak peek um, and a quick summary of all of the, the fab content that the team have produced yesterday. So welcome, Chris. How is it? How's it all going? Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's uh, it's great to be part of this podcast, um, this future focused podcast. Yeah, it's the Gen CFO Academy is going really well. It's it's a bit of a brainchild of mine from probably four or five years ago when lots of people were coming to me saying, hey, Chris, you know, you talk about transformation and change and the future of the profession and all that great stuff. But how the hell do we do it? <laughs> you know, how do we do it? We see all the thought leadership from the institutions and we see lots of people talking about it, but how do we actually do it? So the academy is kind of that managerial operational level where we go through lots of different subjects relating to future finance. And um, it's for people who want to start doing this stuff. So we've had some amazing sessions, which I'll, ha I'll go through every single one, <laughs> but I'm not sure how much time we've got. But had some amazing sessions um, yesterday. And we've got another great day ahead of us today. Yeah, well, I had a look at the agenda and and whilst I didn't get a chance to attend every session, I have got a few of them highlighted to have a, have a look and a, and a view afterwards because all the content is available afterwards, isn't it, for people to, to consume absolutely. on demand as required. Yeah, absolutely. You can sign up to the website where all the re replays will be and also Gen CFO has a 365 online community um, where pro members can you know get the archive in there. Uh, whether it's the academy or all of our webinars or whatever it's there's a ton of content in there um, and that that's really what gen cfo is we're not a training provider and we're not an institution um we're not an events company we're a sort of community of practice and you know people are are coming together to learn and to share and that peer learning is really why people are here Fabulous. So, um, so you've got what I was find really interesting is that you've actually got people in practice that have been and done a lot of these new, um, well, I, well this is such a mix. I would say new ways of working, but there there is so much. Um, when I looked at the the agenda, so what was your what was your favourite session yesterday? Was there one that really stood out? There, there were. I think the program is fantastic um you know credit to the team uh Sophie Liv and Ryan who you know brought this together marketed it and got you know close to I think a thousand people to the event um <clears throat> it kicked off really well which was kind of nothing to do with our core subjects of you know agility and automation and analytics it kicked off really well with um Ben Littleton who's actually a football journalist <laughs> and I'm I'm not a football fan but I loved what he did and he he's done lo lots of research as a journalist with um, football coaches mm. and he'd, he'd written a book about taking penalties because you know in England we're not very good at taking penalties and we've <laughs> lost a lot of big games taking penalties and nothing to do with football you know you don't even yeah. have to be a sports fan it was all about the sort of shoulders up um, and he talked about cohesion of a team and adaptability of a team. And if anyone's watched the film Moneyball, which is about, you know, identifying talent and then teams going on to win with this kind of unknown talent, um, he, he kind of did the same in the football world and um, identified a load of players back in 2014 who have now gone on to greatness so it would that was that was really interesting just tr thinking about how you build a team how you build a team based on attitude as much as this core talent and the reason why it was such a standout for me is that i don't think ben realized but it's very much <clears throat> relevant to what what we're going through now as a profession because i think we're almost going through this identity crisis you know should we be accountants should we be business partners should we be sort of technology focused and what what ben was highlighting there was that we need to be adaptable and we need to start bringing in new talent and this new talent is going to be different 
to us and it's going to be different um and a lots of other sessions throughout the day kind of reinforce that point whether it was changing our work patterns whether it was changing you know the the structure of our teams or the projects that we do for gen z and, and then obviously the core capability around automation and analytics and all that good stuff so i think it kicked off really well with ben littleton um but there was so much in there really and i i love that conversation that you know that concept of being adaptable i think in finance whilst we might adapt in subsets of our role we don't always expand out into other areas and i think the most impactful finance people that i have met in you know when i'm going out and i'm consulting and doing all those kind of things is are those that are willing to put their hand up that even if they don't know how to do it exceptionally well at the moment, that they're willing to step up. And, and I think that's something that we need to not be afraid of in finance, you know, and actually, you know, start to step out of our comfort zone. Absolutely. And, you know, he he was highlighting, you know, multi-millionaire megastars and mega coaches, right, who were, you know, being adaptable. And he linked adaptability to being vulnerable as as well and one of the best coaches that he kind of highlighted was I can't remember the name because I'm not a fan but you know that every year they did a creative project and there was this photograph of you know this this coach that by day was no doubt you know sort of a very strong leader clear about his mission you know clear about leading this team you know everything you expect from a leader but then he was lying on this stage kind of on the floor <laughs> you know, surrounded by petals doing this creative dance. So um, oh, I've just been told it was Graham Potter. So if anyone <laughs> if anyone knows Graham Potter, then in the, that's who I'm talking about. So, you know, and, and his point was, you need to be vulnerable. You need to be open to new experiences. You need to do things that are going to test you a little bit, even in leadership. So, yeah, I completely agree with you. When, when we're going out, and I know that you go out quite a lot, you know, through consulting and also with the podcast, you know, I'm similar, you know, it might be second nature to us, but I think when you're doing a core job, you have to stretch yourself to do these things and being adaptable um, is, is really important to that. And big companies are starting to get behind some of this, you know, it's not just an individual journey. We had, um, you know, Asda talking about hyper agile accountants and spoke to Chloe and Laura about their work pattern flexibility and it was amazing like these are senior directors of transformation within finance who are job sharing who are completely flexible on their hours you know who are but who are also delivering you know huge transformation projects to finance and it's that sort of thinking that sort of adaptability I think that we need to see um that was sort of as does use case but it was also sort of backed up by um we had chloe from liberty global who was talking about rpa and automation but she also said that it's really hard to recruit for some of these admin jobs now so we need to be kind of automating those admin jobs because gen z don't want to be doing those jobs you know with the the natural sort of you know early career um resource that we have they don't want to be doing those jobs so they're being adaptable so you can almost you know throughout the whole day you just had this sort of world developing of you know new ways of working new talent um you know better jobs um and that and that requires adaptability from leadership I love that. That was actually one of the ones I was going to ask you about, actually, the the, the ladies from Asda, because they're, 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 like you say, they're job sharing. And how do they manage that? Did they give any sort of tips and thoughts, you know, for the, maybe there's a, a couple of FDs or CFOs that are thinking, oh, maybe I'd like to look at that within my team. Like, how did, how did they approach it? So <clears throat> they were, they were massive advocates of that flexibility um for one so I think they got it and they were championing it championing it internally is supported by leadership for sure um they'd had very frank conversations I think with their um with their leadership team saying look I I need this flexibility otherwise I just can't work at, at Asda um you know to the point where they're saying I do not want to go back to five days a week so there was a sort of decision point 
made where we either keep good talent, we keep people happy, or they leave. Um, so I think there was some very, at first, there was a very frank and open conversations about what flexibility means. And, and that can be lots of different things, right? It could be mean, meaning part-time, it could be um, job sharing, it could be flexible hours doing a full-time job, right? He says you've got to sort of work nine to five. Um, funnily enough, when we did the poll during the session, everybody wanted flexibility, 100%. And there was a good 100 of people on there. And 95%, I think, wanted uh, varying hours. They just didn't want to work nine to five pattern anymore. So what does that mean to us? You know, we need to be listening to our teams, allowing them to work when they want to work. And specifically, Chloe and Laura said that you've got to manage on output. You can't micromanage people. You've got to build the trust in your team so that they go and, you know, deliver. Um, this isn't about, you know, putting a bit of software on your keyboard and seeing whether people are actually working, right? Which has has happened in the past. Uh, I think call centers do that. Um, now, this is about building trust and allowing people to sort of get on with their jobs and they were so happy about it. And it was sort of like, you know, it, it was a funny one because I think when people are truly happy at work, um, people challenge it and they sort of say, well, why are you so happy at work? You know, like, you know, are you not working? And it's the total opposite in their case. You know, they were loving their job. They were loving the arrangement and they were delivering. I also think it's, and again, it's a really interesting, so there's a couple of research reports that have recently come out about women in leadership positions and team lead positions and I've, and also, um, and the stats actually really surprised me. Like I, I knew that we had some challenges. Um, mm. I didn't realize how challenging it is. And I do feel like that that concept of flexibility, you know, the ability to, like you say, just have two hours to go pick up the kids and then work two hours later could actually help drive the change that everyone wants to see without the use of positive discrimination and all of those pieces. I think it gives us um, a real opportunity to get people into the workforce to add, you know, to add value, to use that talent without necessarily having to, to force it through. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, they were very, keen to say also that look this isn't all about parents and children and and being you know mum right this is offering flexibility to to gen z you know people want to come in and they want their side gig you know people want to work for a big enterprise you know to learn but they also might want to sort of do something a bit more entrepreneurial or voluntary now you know i've been around a bit like if someone came to me and said that when i was employing them for a full time job you know 10 20 years ago i would just be like well you're not committed to this job yeah but i don't think that is the case now so offering flexibility to everybody doesn't doesn't it's not a show of commitment you know that you're going to get more from these people because you offer that flexibility and you know i'll say it again because i think it was really important point the the poll was saying that people wanted varying hours they didn't want to work less they didn't want to shirk they didn't want to you know just have a part-time job and sit on the beach for three days they just wanted that sort of flexibility so how do we do that I think that's really easy to introduce right and I, I even some of the companies that I've worked in in the past they've had core hours which is kind of one step towards that where you know you all have to be online between say you know 10 and 1 but you can work any hours outside of that um you know now return to work policy is we all have to be in for a team day on tuesday and wednesday or whatever you know these these things should be remaining if that's what people want and it looks like that is what people want it's been really interesting, actually, just looking at our organisation. So we're quite flexible, right? We have a mix of um, individuals that want flexibility for various reasons. And you're right, it's not just parenting. Um, so we, we've always, and certainly since, I would say, since COVID, that's driven a different conversation. Now, the challenge I think that everyone needs to perhaps think about, certainly having done it, is how do you make sure it's fair? How do you make sure that um, for those that want that flexibility that you're, because it tends to be quite individual, the flexibility required. 
Um, so it's it's about for me, it's about making sure you're you're behaving fairly, and that can be challenging with different roles. So support roles, customer facing roles, that could that's one way of looking at it. But if we think about finance, well, actually a lot of the work can be done outside of ours. Uh, that that gives us a maybe a, a new opportunity in finance to actually set ourselves aside and offer more flexibility than maybe other departments. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, fairness, absolutely. You know, but I think you can overthink these things a little bit. Um, You know, the, so I I used to work in John Lewis. We were talking to um, Starbucks yesterday as well. Both, both operate this sort of partnership model. Yeah, you're not employees, you're not employers. You're, we're all partners together. And I, I think what I learned at my time at John Lewis and I think my man Raj from Starbucks yesterday said the same thing. It's that you you have to manage people at, at a very sort of individual level. So if I'm being a good manager to my team, I'm doing that anyway, right? I don't think we we can sort of factor in bad management into this. It's like if you're a good manager and you're managing your team, you know that that person wants to leave at four o'clock for whatever reason. You know, you know that Mondays are particularly hard for them or Fridays are particularly hard for them. So let them have that time. Yeah, you've got that discretion as a manager in in most companies. But what John Lewis and Starbucks do is that they have, you know, larger HR teams, you know, huge HR teams in terms of John Lewis that support all of that to make sure that you are being a good manager and individuals do get what they want. So I think you can overthink this. This is just being a good manager, knowing your team well enough that, you know, someone's got to do school pickup, but they will work later. And you know what, if they can't work later because, you know, the house has imploded, they'll put in the hours the next week, you know. So that's just building trust. Um, You know, we do have events, we have community meetups and things like that. So when our team aren't working during the day, I know that they're putting in the hours elsewhere when we have these evening events. So, you know, it's, it is about being fair, but I think you can overthink that. Uh, I just call it sort of close management of your team. And I think that's a really interesting concept in that we talk a lot of this about being fundamental management skills. Yeah, but it's quite interesting that this has now become the, not the norm, but an accepted and a requirement of managers. And I do think there is something about how we train and build our leaders and how we support them and develop these skills. Um, but talking of which, I think there was a really interesting comment you made earlier about Gen Z. So tell us a little bit about some of the conversations that have come out, you know, about who they are as a generation and, you know, um, and what they're expecting and want from leaders. Yeah, so I think the first thing I'd, I'd want to say about this is that it, it, you know, we are, we seem to be sort of polarizing generations at the moment. And I don't think that's a good thing. The reason why Gen CFO is talking about Gen Z is because I want people to talk about their strengths and how we collaborate with them and how we can learn because they grew up with mobiles and iPads in their hands, right? We didn't, a lot of leaders didn't. So this is not about them versus us, first of all, this is about how we can all work together. Um, what we heard yesterday was that, you know, they are, there, there are skills within the finance team that need to be learned by some people. Um, there are skills within the finance team that are already there because Gen Z probably did computer science at school. You know, they, they, they probably built a robot and coded, you know, so can we use that, that expertise within the team, almost sort of reverse mentoring people. You know, there was a lot of talk about, um, you know, talent was not one to, you know, uh, entry talent was not looking for an admin role, right? It wasn't looking to sit in AP processing invoices for two years. You know, it wasn't looking to sort of be in that transactional space anymore. So there's an opportunity for automation. Well, guess what? The same people who don't want to do that job probably have some level of automation skills. If you put them on an RPA course or a citizen developer course or a citizen automator course, they're the ones who are going to start automating the own, their own job. What a great opportunity for us. Yeah. So it's, I think sometimes there's quite a negative conversation around sort of Gen Z and what they want. But actually, you know, who were the fools? Sort of us doing paperwork, you know, for... 50 hours a week 
um, and doing that for three years before we got a promotion to AP manager or someone who just wants to come in and get rid of that job, you know, and automate it away. So there's some huge strengths within the Gen Z population. Um, you know, obviously there's there's inexperience, but, you know, we were all inexperienced at some point. And that's for us, again, as good managers, to sort of help them on that career path. Um, there, There is... There, I, so I don't think it's generational. I actually think it's more of an attitude. Um, there are some people with a lot of grey in their beard who are transformers, right? Who are absolutely looking to automate their roles, you know, make certain roles redundant, not the people, but the roles redundant and give it over to the robots, you know, give it over to integration and software. So I think it's it's super important that we just look at this in the round now. And maybe less of this hierarchy where the boss sits at the top and knows all, you know, we need to um, work in a, in a much more kind of collaborative way. I think that's an incredible point. And I think uh, some of our, our listeners are also agreeing with it, agreeing with that point, Chris, about not all transformers are the new, are the people coming in our Gen Zs. You know, that there is a, an amazing wealth of talent that know that things can be done better and want it to be done better. Um, that are sitting you know in in existing roles I think you know if you think about those that have been doing the role for such a while they a lot of them want a new challenge and I we talk a lot about elevating the work of finance you know it's not just about like you say stepping into business partnering but it's actually building those technical skills that 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 capability which is really really exciting so yeah no I think that's a, a fabulous point and I I also like your concept of reverse mentoring but imagine a finance team where it went both ways so you had you know those those older generations mentoring and sharing their experience the younger generation sharing their technical capabilities and if you think about how quickly technology has changed you know people that have been in finance for for 10 years they have seen everything from mainframes all the way down to like you say apps and i you know and ipads so Mm -hmm. We're, we're surprisingly adaptable and in finance you know if you think I think and it's just an exciting time yeah so. absolutely you know we've we've got a lot of these skills already you know we're already analytical you know these are these sweeping generalizations but there's a lot of research about it but you know generally you know we we, we probably see an interest in the profession because we're business people and we're commercial um we're analytical you know, all really important to things like data projects or transformation projects, right? You know, most transformation projects would have a business analyst. Well, that's just us focused on processes and change, right? If we're trying to do an analytics or a data project, that's just us, but partnering with different tech and more data, you know? So we we already have a lot of these skills. Um, so, you know, don't think this is completely new to us. It's not. I, I've actually got you know, I do some training on this every now and again, and I've got two slides. One is full of kind of new skills in this area, and one is full of the skills we already have, but you need both. So, you know, it's the the business acumen and it's the, the, um, the, the sort of bringing context to the result that's really important. Um, that's something that maybe someone more experienced can help, you know, someone in the team learn you know, through their own experience, through working with the business, through being in an industry for longer. Equally, if I've got someone who's just done a computer science degree, has some interest in, you know, accounting and business, when they come in, can I talk to them about, you know, automation or micro automation or databases or data management or visualization or how to build an app? You know, if I can put the power of my my tools into someone's hand by using people within my team, you know, that's that's an amazing thing to do. Um, So, yeah, I, I, you know, I would I'm trying to sort of squash the hierarchy (laughs) with what, you know, we're doing at Gen CFO. I've always walked, worked agile. Um, the, The hierarchy is a very traditional way of working. And I'm not suggesting that the leaders have all the answers, but there is a sort of disconnect between the top and the bottom. Uh, I think right now we need communities of practice where people are all getting together, 
maybe with the leader in the middle, but you know, everybody else just surrounding that leader saying, right, how do we do um, analytics? How do we do automation? How can I improve our agility? Because you know what, the pandemic almost killed me. So I don't want to do that again. So th that's the sort of conversation we should be having and almost in a sort of war room um, style, but as a, in a sustainable way, rather than just doing it off the back of a crisis. And you made a really interesting comment there about the disconnect between the top and the bottom. What do you see as the, the disconnect? Tell me where that, that thought comes from. So <clears throat> I think, so there is a, you know, in terms of the roles that we see right now, there is, you know, I'd argue 200 years of tradition <laughs> in the accounting <laughs> profession, right? So you come in and you you earn your stripes and you move up and then you do a manager job and then you move up and, you know, you might one day get to, you know, financial controller and, you know, then you start doing something a bit more commercial and then you sort of move to head of commercial finance and then maybe one day, you know, you'll become an FD or a CFO. That, that is, that's locked in, it's baked in, it's a career ladder that we're all used to. But my experience was much wider than that. You know, I worked in finance transformation in some big companies, Amazon, John Lewis, Vodafone. And all of the teams that I worked in were multi-skilled, cross-functional, agile teams. And there's, it's such a richer experience. And there's no reason why, you know, that approach should be seen as a temporary approach. It's like when you do a program or run a project, it's always a temporary project. You know, we're looking to implement something and off we go. But working as a team, working in, you know, a, a sort of multidisciplinary team that's diverse is going to be so much more high performing than assuming this hierarchy and creating this disconnect between an experienced leader and new skills that are coming in at the bottom. And if, if I'm not aware of these new skills coming in, you know, I see a CV and I talk to HR, but I think even HR are struggling to recruit in this area. You know, we've got a bit of a existential crisis, as I say, you know, which way should we go with this? You know, should we be more business partnering? Okay, we need to get communication skills. Should I be more of a, you know, an analyst? Oh, okay, we need computer science people, STEM, you know, skills. Um, and you talk to HR and, it's just like, well, what do you want? You know, we don't know. Um, and the org structures that we're putting in place right now aren't helping. So having more of a, and it, it might be alongside the traditional structure at the moment, but having a community to the easiest way to talk about it or an agile team of multidisciplinary people is going to be a way of sort of developing that team. And concepts like continuous improvement and you know process improvement and bringing in information products through analytics you know that's that's the future to me because you can be responsive to the business then rather than just one person at the top saying what do you want oh okay I've got that and no one else really being aware of that I think that's a, a really good observation. And I think there is an assumption that everyone that works in finance one day wants to be a CFO. And actually, the more people in finance I talk to, they they see CFO as an incredible opportunity. But some people, that isn't where, where their enjoyment lies. They, yeah. they want to be able to float. They want to be able to dip into analytics for a few years get their ground in there they want to then use that knowledge go out and do business partnering and have conversations with the wider business and still have that commercial view but they don't necessarily want to be the person right at the top you know some people do yeah. it, like it, it 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 drives them but I think there is an interesting perception I love your concept of a flatter structure and I think that's an in maybe an interesting topic for the next Gen CFO Academy like how do we structure finance in a way that that enables they the people all people at all levels to to thrive, but also maybe to give more flexibility in there. Yeah, it's a it's it's a good question, which I you know would love to get get into. <laughs> I don't have time right now, but but just to, to your point about people's ambitions, I completely agree with, with what you're saying. You know, there's only one top job, yeah. 
I think more people when they enter the profession and even throughout their career probably want to be their own boss than a CFO. Yeah, they are. They're kind of like, yeah, I like doing this, but I've got this itch, itch to scratch over here. And, you know, the side gigs are just side gigs now. <laughs> like Everyone has a side <laughs> gig. Right? Um, so, you know, people who are preventing that, um, you know, they're, they're just demotivating their team. So the way I see some of these projects or, or full-time teams at some point is allowing your team to scratch that itch. You know, can you be the boss of our new analytics project? You know, can you use your skills to lead this um, internally first, but then out to the business and who knows, out to your customers at some point? Um, so I think there's a, that you just we need to think differently about how we're sort of motivating people and how we're using resource. Um, and it's super creative as well. I think that's the other thing. You know, if, it, in the olden days, you know, I think people accepted that traditional hierarchy, that ladder, which still exists, right? But um, I think the Gen Z and the opportunity that's there and the technology that they have in their personal lives, they don't, you know, they, they're less patient to sit there and wait. So can I be more creative in my job is probably one question. Can I do something and add value much quicker? That's another question. Do I have skills to support the business in a different way? Well, yes, yes, and yes, if you start looking at analytics and automation and how we change our team. So it's a perfect storm, I think, to use our talent in a different way. Um, and maybe they don't want to be a CFO. Who, who cares? You know, If they're being creative boss of analytics, off you go. <laughs> Absolutely. Just think of the agility that will give our finance team. So we talked about, obviously, we, we don't quite know what finance needs to be right now. You know, are we techies? Are we, you know, data geeks? Are we um, commercial, you know, commercial whiz kids? Um, but if you think about what that would, that ability to shift and change and to bring different, maybe different parts of finance to the fore at different times, depending on where we're at, that's a huge amount of capability and agility that we're bringing to the business. So maybe there isn't an answer. We aren't one thing. We're, we're just a little bit of everything in the. In yeah, the there's a great, there's a great debate going on at the moment about whether we should be generalists or specialists in work, let alone in the profession. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a raging debate. In the past, we've probably been seen as specialists. And how actually how that's reflecting a little bit in our profession is the specialism of audit is being questioned. And should that be a completely separate thing now, rather than us being trained as accountants, getting experience in audit and then being auditors, should that whole thing just be carved out as a specialism, a bit like, you know, pensions and tax. It's it's just another thing. So what does it leave? It leaves the generalism, uh, the 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 generalist approach of business and finance and funding and information that's that's our bag the the risk though and a few people said it yesterday is that other teams are getting very good at this as well and so you know there should there could be a sales team or an ops team or a marketing team who are now starting to report you know operational kpis plus a bit of financial kpis um as we kind of democratize the end-to-end -end process in business through automation, it's no longer finance doing their bit and procurement doing their bit. It's everyone doing everything. So we need to own the whole process. We need to own analytics. We need because otherwise we've got varying people reporting varying things. It's up to us to sort of own that one version of the truth, which is a very sort of you know cliche thing. But someone has to own data and reporting. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, we've got to get in there and, and we've got to go and, you know, do a bit of a PR job as well on the rest of the company to say, look, we can do this because if you ask the business what they want us to do, they'll say, oh yeah, more reconciliations and paying people. Cause you're really good at that. And we're like, no, 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 no. We're actually really good at all this other stuff, but you haven't seen it yet. So I think that's the, the challenge to leadership. You know, you need to start selling this capability to the business um, and owning it. And there is a clear remit 
and mandate for CFOs to lead transformation and digital transformation within their teams and within the organization. So pick it up, pick up the ball <laughs> and run with it. <laughs> Not that we're talking about rugby. <laughs> no, um, you know, God forbid we should talk about rugby, uh, no. to be fair, Chris. Um, <laughs> definitely better than football. I apologise for any football fans listening. Um, and uh, yeah, we won't talk about uh, the game, the recent game. The Autumn games. International. Yeah, no, 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 yeah, definitely not. Very, very quickly <laughs> move on. Um, but yeah, I think there is, there is an interesting piece around, and I love... Um, I think that is something we need to think about is like, are we specialists? Are we generalists? And is do we have to be one or the other? I guess is the other question, isn't it? Is like, are we teams with specialists and with generalists? And, and we just, it's up to the CFO and the team to figure out the right mix within an organization. Because it can differ from industry to industry, can't it? Where, what yeah. the makeup should be within an organization. It, it can, it can. and I, But I think we've got examples of, you know, within the industry already of how this can look right i i'd sometimes talk about the need for pensions right from a cfo point of view and bear with me because it's not very interesting but if it's <laughs> if the point i'm making a point you know I, i'm a cfo and i know the workforce needs to have a pension so you know i own the pension space right i get somebody in to support me to set up a pension and you know that's managed and off we go it doesn't mean that I need to sort of be the master of pensions. It doesn't mean that I need to go and understand financial markets and how we trade unit trusts and how I make sure that there's value in that pension. It doesn't mean that I need to sort of go and be a trader for a month, you know, to really understand this thing called a pension, right? You, you, what, what we're trying to do here is know enough to make an informed decision as to whether to do it or not, whether to manage ad in an agile way, whether to, you know, lead on in automation and, and analytics, you know, how we manage this stuff. So I'd say that, you know, think of this new capability as just another string to the bow, but it doesn't mean you have to go and be a data scientist to go and do analytics. You know, how many times I've been asked, do I need to go and learn Python, Chris? It's like, look, if you've got a very busy job, you're not going to be a data scientist anytime soon. You know, you're struggling to get to advanced Excel skills. So what are you talking about? You know, but you do need to know enough. And the pension analogy is, is, you know, what I use sometimes. It's like, look, no analytics, no, you've got to do it. No, there is a need for it. No enough to lead it, but then build the team around you to do it. You know, this is not necessarily a leadership thing that you're going to, you know, go and be trading unit you might want to i don't know be trading on the side everyone's got a side gig maybe cfos <laughs> will be trading as well but but i think that's an interesting point as well that it's not just it's i don't think it's a one size fits all because some people thrive in an environment where they are the specialist and i think other people thrive in an environment where they are the generalist and yeah. i think there's a danger with us deciding what finance is that we make the decision for everybody within it rather than saying actually we're going to make sure that we've got the right training the right support and the capabilities for people to be either one and that's I guess the challenge isn't it how do we make sure we build career paths that work for both within finance? absolutely and that's that is a really important point that I this goes back to my HR point really I don't think those career paths are understood at the moment and I'm certainly not telling people how they should, you know, build their careers. The, you know, the career path for, let's call it business analytics from a finance point of view, hasn't been built. But one thing's for sure, you certainly don't learn that skill by being a qualified accountant. There was a great session yesterday called Unqualif Unqualified, you know, data skills and analytics. Um, you certainly don't use it with our current HR L&D training, you know, that's within most organizations. So where are you picking up those skills? What is the career path for someone who is more technically minded, who wants to specialize in that area, who, you know, has come in to the business and gone, oh my God, you know, I'm an analyst, but they want me to go and talk to the business and present numbers all the time because I'm a business partner now. Actually, there is, should be space for those, you know, people who want to specialize in data. And if you're, if you're able to generalize and be a bit of everything, then great. But yeah, sure, there's this space to 
specialize as well. The, the, the issue I feel that we have right now is that leadership don't fully understand those career paths. HR don't understand those career paths. Um, individuals don't understand the, the opportunity and the prospect because there's no career path. So they want to do it, but is it leading them down a blind alley? You know, it's 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I started to do finance transformation in shared service centers, everyone was like, Chris, what are you doing? Because you're moving from the business and business partnering into the back office. And I was like, yeah, but, you know, I see more true business partnering in shared services than I do from FP&A sat on their bums in head office. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, I learned so much from being in shared service, working with technology, working with process, working with integrators. So I think we need to rip it out, look at it again in terms of org structure, in terms of career paths, and bring this new capability in. And, and we're on our five minute warning. So um, oh. <laughs> it's great. I don't normally get warnings around time on the podcast. So I have to do all this check in. But I think the final conversation perhaps is just to talk about the concept of agility because it's come up a lot just in this conversation. So um, what other learnings around agility and agile finance have come up yesterday um, in the sessions? So uh, j- just to de- define agility. So Agility to me is our our ability to respond to the business, our ability to respond to the market. So agility is is being aligned to the business, first of all, but then being aligned on on what, you know, one thing that that came out yesterday was business partnering and agility um, isn't about, you know, just communicating to the business better. Yeah, it data is the enabler to communication with the business. Insights is the enabler to finance business partnering. Yeah, so agility isn't just about being aligned better to the business and being a great communicator and talking about your spreadsheets. It is much more than that. It's you know enabling a growth strategy. It's um, it's understanding what that business line, line of business, the whole business wants to achieve and helping deliver it, truly helping deliver it, which is obviously a million miles away from us saying, here's a budget, here's a variance or oh, slap wrists, you hit it or you didn't. You know, we've got to move way past that if we're talking about sort of, you know, agility in the job. Then there's there's the physical agility that we talked about with, you know, Asda and the hyper agile accountants and how work patterns might change, how we employ people might change, how we can improve people's roles through um, changing process with automation. So there, there's lots of layers to agility. Um, and it's, you know, it, it, it's all got to be looked at. I think from a sort of digital finance function strategy point of view, so ha- not just the occasional transformation projects, but as a whole, how do we operate in the future? Yeah, and that's a really big topic. And I guess that's that's the point, isn't it? Is that it's part of so many different pieces. So, so talking about lots of different pieces, lots of different learnings, what's up on the agenda for the rest of, uh, of the day? Are there any particular sessions that you're excited to go see and you're, you've got on your I must watch list? You've got uh, a lot of them to be very, very fair. Yeah, I was going to say, I was, was going to have to quickly look at the agenda because I was, <laughs> honestly, when you're in the thick of it, it's literally running from one session to uh, the next i would say you know there's the the, the program is great um there's so much in there i'd say every session has been well thought about in terms of topic and then the speakers that are involved have been you know selected based on that the next session which um is a really interesting one i i don't know whether anyone's sort of heard of water drop but water drops now new group CFO is talking next. It's Sylvia Ianita. Now, um Waterdrop is one of the fastest growing companies in the world at the moment. 
Um, really interesting concept about how we drink water and how we can sort of benefit from drinking more water. Um, there's, there's, you know, come to the session if you want to understand more about the company. But the, but they have, they are on a growth journey and they're on a massive growth journey and they've been digital first. And Sylvia was actually shortlisted for our digital finance function awards this year because she's done such a good job in supporting the company's growth, growing the company with automation in mind. Um, you know, her husband's a blockchain sort of enthusiast. So, you know, I'm sure it's in the blood a little bit in the family. But yeah, I, you know, I'm looking forward to talking to Sylvia next and a really live and real use case of how all this stuff can benefit uh, a growth company. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure we're all looking for growth at the moment. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's a, there's, there's a great stream. So I've had a look at the agenda and there's quite a few on there. So for those of you that are listening to this podcast on demand after the session, um, don't worry, you will, we will get, we'll send you the, we'll put in the link to the academy where you can um, obviously sign up and look to, to get access potentially. And I want to say before Ryan sends me a message to tell me to get off because everyone needs their cup of coffee and their cup of tea for this break. I want to say thank you very much, Chris. I really appreciate your time. And it's been great to talk to you about everything, agility, talent, and, and the future of finance, which is incredibly exciting. Lovely. Well, thank you for having me. And uh, thanks for being part of the Academy. It's uh, spread the word. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. And we'll speak to you soon.